name is Amanda Plasek, and I'm the Director of Music here at St. Mary of the Mount. And I'm here today to talk with you about the changes in the Gloria. Just a little bit of background on the Prayer Gloria. The Prayer Gloria begins with the words that the angels sang at Jesus' birth. It is a powerful prayer that acknowledges God as the Trinity, as well as gives his request that his peace be granted unto his people. The text of the Gloria is one of the most drastic changes that is resulting from the New Roman Missal translation. However, it more closely reflects the sentiment of the original Latin text. When we sing the Gloria, the congregation sings a small set of phrases. This is called the refrain. Then the cantor would sing verses by him or herself. The refrain that we currently sing or speak is, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Now let's look at the first phrase of the Gloria in the New Translation. Taking out the new pew cards, and keep them out because you'll need them. The words to the new first phrase is, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. Now, how did the USCCB come to decide that these would be the new words? Well, to find the answer, let's take a look at the Latin. The first phrase of the Gloria in Latin, Latin is Gloria in excelsis Deo. Now, if you've ever been to Christmas Day Mass, and you've ever sang Angels We Have Heard on High, you have sung the phrase Gloria in excelsis Deo before. This does translate to glory to God in the highest. The next phrase, however, is et in terra pax hominibus bone voluntatis. Now, what does that translate to? Et in terra pax translates to and on earth peace. Hominibus means to people, and bone voluntatis means of goodwill. This part of the Gloria is so important because it connects with the scripture from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 14, which is, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Which, of course, in this case does not mean men and the male species. It means more humankind and people. By changing the words that we sing, we are strengthening the connection with the original scripture verse that it quotes. Now, let's look at some of the other words that, if we sang the Gloria, the cantor usually sings on his or her own. The next paragraph on our papers is very repetitive. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Now, that's a lot of common repetition there that we didn't use to sing or speak. And the reason for this is, in our New Roman Missal translation, the newly revised section of the Gloria seems as if we were stammering or stuttering in a way to find the best words to describe our God. It's as if we're stumbling over ourselves to praise Him over and over, and the Gloria is a song of praise. The third paragraph is very similar to what we sang previously, except for the fact that some of the phrases are repeated or slightly reworded. Again, the repetitive nature found in paragraph 3 is, You take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world. Receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Have mercy on us. Again, with this paragraph, we're feeling a new sense of entreating or pleading, but with an, a mixed emotion of joy built into that. It feels like you're building into excitement in this new part of the translation. So, that's a little background of how the new translation of the Gloria came to be. At this point, I would be doing my job if I didn't introduce to you the new musical setting of the Gloria. At this point, I will sing the refrain through two times, and just as if we were singing it during the liturgy, the refrain will be repeated after each verse, which is where you would come in, and the cantor would sing the verses by him or herself. And now, onto the piano.
Thank you, Amanda, for introducing us to the Gloria and to the new musical setting we'll be using here in our parish. I'd just like to talk to you briefly about the Liturgy of the Word. The Liturgy of the Word actually starts when you sit down <laughs> and actually finishes when you see the gifts start to come forward, collection being taken up. All of that is the Liturgy of the Word, from all of the readings, the responsorial psalm, the homily, excuse me, the gospel, the homily, uh, the creed, and then the intercessions. Um, then we sit down once again, and then the Mass continues to the Liturgy of the Eucharist. We're going to take the Creed out. That's for another time. We're going to focus on the Liturgy of the Word. How many of you have gone into a religious store or gone to the bookstore and gone to the Bible section? And you go into the Bible section and you look and there's shelves of Bibles. <laughs> and you wonder to yourself, how is this possible? I thought there was only one Bible. Well, guess what? There's many different translations and many different purposes for those translations. So you're going to find the woman's devotional Bible. You're going to find the, the study Bible. You're going to find uh, the Bible that's geared towards the youth. And so they're translated for very specific purposes. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible was not first given in English. <laughs> Okay, it actually comes from the ancient languages of the time, which would have been written in Greek and in Hebrew. So everything that we have, and by the way, from there on, Latin, everything that we have is a translation from one of those languages. Greek, Hebrew, some of them are translated from very ancient Latin. And so we use a very specific translation here in the Catholic liturgy, and it's actually the New American Translation, the New American Bible, it's called. And so the good news for us as we're here and as we're thinking about the new translations for the Mass, guess what? It ain't changing. <laughs> the scriptures that we use and the scriptures that we use, they're not retranslated, at least for now. Although I hear they're working on it, it'll take many years in the future. The only changes that will be occurring, actually, as we engage here in the liturgy, will be uh, the introduction to the gospel. Introduction of the Gospel, when I say, just like the opening dialogue of Mass in the introductory rites, when I say the Lord be with you, we know that there's now a new response. Instead of saying, and also with you, we say, and with your spirit. <laughs> right? So that will be also part of the opening dialogue to the Mass. The second uh, minor uh, change that's going to happen, oh my, oh my, are you ready? That's right, just the word O. Oh. So in the opening dialogue before the gospel, after we say, and with your spirit, I say a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. And we respond now, glory to you, O Lord. So we're just putting the O in there. Why are we doing that? At any time we use the, the uh, a symbol, a single syllable word for God, addressing God, that would just be God, Lord, etc. We're going to put an O in front of it usually just to kind of add emphasis, add a sense of dignity to that. Those are the only real translations or new translations that are happening for this, besides the Creed, which we will talk about, and segment four of our series. Liturgy of the Word. Just a couple quick reminders. Some of the developments we've done here with the Liturgy of the Word. Very important is, try to prepare that word before you come here. Before you come to the celebration of Mass, so you can listen attentively, don't have to read, look in it as, listen to it as it's proclaimed by the lector or by the priest or deacon. Um, so you've re-prepared those readings, and we actually have those readings in our bulletin at least the week ahead of time, so you can read them ahead and prepare yourselves for them. Second thing, we've entered uh, some holy silence into our liturgy. So after each of the readings, instead of just moving on to the next one, we actually pause in some silence to let that proclaimed word enter more fully into our minds and our hearts in that silence that's spoken uh, afterwards, God speaking in the silence. And finally, um, it's important for us uh, to realize that the word prepares us for something. We move from the liturgy of the word into the sacrifice and celebration of the liturgy of the the word of God speaks to us. If today you hear his voice, harden not your heart.